Good afternoon. I'm Sushma Raman and I'm the Executive Director of the CAR Center for Human Rights Policy. It's my pleasure to moderate this event today. We're gonna to be talking about the Commission on Unalienable Rights established by Secretary of State uh, Mike Pompeo and their recent release of a draft report. About a year ago, Secretary of State Pompeo announced the formation of this Commission on Unalienable Rights charged to undertake one of the most profound re-examinations of the unalienable rights in the world since the 1948 Universal Declaration. According to him, the commission would re-examine human rights in a genuinely philosophical manner, rethinking the most basic of questions. What does it mean to say or claim that something is in fact a human right? Is it in fact true, as our Declaration of Independence asserts, that as human beings, we, all of us, every member of our human family are endowed by our creator with certain unalienable rights. In an op-ed published the day before in the Wall Street Journal, Secretary Pompeo complained that human rights advocacy has lost its bearings and become more of an industry than a, mor than a moral compass. He hoped that the commission would reorient institutions like the United Nations back to their original missions. Human rights activists and some academics responded to the commission with justifiable concern that it could redirect US human rights policy in ways that could be self-defeating and could create serious damage to international cooperation for the protection of human rights. As Matthias Riso, whom we will hear from this afternoon, wrote in a Car Center discussion paper, the human rights community did not readily accept Pompeo's characterization of the committee's tasks in mostly philosophical terms. Quote, they see at best some philosophical icing and what is a political cake, and at worst intellectual deceit from an illusion of a fair-minded investigation with an underlying political agenda that is already set, unquote. On July 16th of this year, the commission released a draft report accompanied by a speech by Secretary Pompeo, where he attacked the 1619 project, questioned the so-called proliferation of rights and the role of international courts, and pointed to America's unique role in championing, quote, the dignity of every human being made in the image of God, unquote. Human rights advocates are concerned that the report presents a very narrow and selective vision of human rights, confirming previously expressed concern. Chief among their issues is the report's calls for rights hierarchies. Today to talk about the Pompeo reports and its ramifications, we're joined by three distinguished speakers. We'll first hear from Matthias Risa, who's the faculty director at the Carr Center for Human Rights Policy and the Lucius N. Littauer Professor of Philosophy and Public Administration at the Harvard Kennedy School. His work primarily addresses issues of global justice, ranging from human rights, inequality, taxation, trade, and immigration to climate change, obligations to future generations, and the future of technology. We'll next hear from Catherine Young, an Associate Professor of Law at Boston College Law School. Her scholarship focuses on comparative constitutional law, economic and social rights, constitutional theory, and positive state obligations, international human rights law, and public law and gender. And finally, we'll hear from Andrea Prasso, the Acting Washington Director at Human Rights Watch, she conducts advocacy before the US government on global human rights issues with a particular focus on national security and human rights. Prior to joining Human Rights Watch, she was a defense attorney with the Office of Military Commissions and served as assistant counsel for Salim Hamdan in the only contested mil military commission trial to date. So thank you all so much for joining us. After we hear from our speakers and have some discussion we will open it up to your questions, which, which you should type into the YouTube chat function. So I'll turn it over to you, Matthias. Thank you, Sushma. Uh, let me begin by saying that the CAR Center has gone through a year long project on renewing human rights and responsibilities in the United States, an assessment of how human rights have been faring in recent times with the goal of submitting recommendations for improvements to an administration with a positive attitude towards human rights whenever such an administration will come along. What this endeavor has revealed has often been rather devastating and we'll come out with a report on this very soon. 
Also, as Sushma mentioned, I myself recently published a paper on the Pompeo Commission expressing very serious doubts about reconnecting to natural law as the 18th century understood it by way of assessing anything about the current state of affairs around human rights. So in these and other ways, the Carr Center is on record for how we think an assessment of where human rights stand should be done. And that is very different from what the Pompeo Commission has done. Accordingly, I of course also share the doubts many in the human rights movement have about this commission even existing. After all, the commission is reassessing the human rights movement, but from the standpoint of what one might call an American constitutional conservative with ex ante misgivings about the validity of international law. That perspective has enormously narrowed in rather problematic ways how the commission engaged with the human rights movement and especially then also how widely it consulted and what came on its radar to begin with. But with all that said, I would like to make a particular point about the report. The report shows that even, even a constitutional conservative with ex ante misgivings about international law ought to endorse human rights commitments substantially beyond what such conservatives normally hold and substantially beyond the current practice of American government and also substantially beyond what one would infer from Secretary Pompeo's statements about the report. He keeps using certain talking points that are to my mind somewhat unrepresentative of what the report actually at a more comprehensive level argues. It also shows, the report also shows that this, that this conservative has very good reason to engage with the structural racism that has shaped the United States in much more profound ways than Secretary Pompeo's triumphalist statements when the report was presented suggested. Since this type of conservative is widespread among the electorate, these are points the human rights movement can and should work with, other concerns about the report notwithstanding and completely acknowledged. Let me elaborate on what the conservative learns here when they actually make their way through the report beyond the talking points that Pompeo is using. First of all, the constitutional conservative learns that the American rights tradition has grown enormously beyond the contributions of the founders whose likenesses so conspicuously decorate the report. The social justice program of the New Deal in particular revolutionized American rights thinking. Social and economic rights, which are always this kind of sticky point for American foreign policy, especially in Republican administrations, social and economic rights are needed, the report explains, to support the ideal of citizenship that has guided American thinking. Social and economic rights intensely interrelated as they are with civil and political rights, according to the UN and according to this report, must be part of American foreign policy, so the report says. Pompeo's own presentations tend to focus on the American tradition and have little to say about human rights per se, though the report presents them as a natural continuation of the American rights tradition. And so here I would say one can only hope that going forward, conservatives will actually ask all Republican administrations in the future to see human rights this way, and then we take it from there. Secondly, the report takes the existence of an international order for granted, an order in which the US needs to collaborate to realize human rights globally. And that is really important because the Trump administration has repeatedly and very explicitly denied the very existence of an international order and any kind of thought that the United States should see itself as a, as a major actor realizing human rights at a global scale. But that is completely taken for granted here. So one can, again, one can only hope that the report stance will become more pronounced in what the administration will actually do and that conservatives themselves will demand such action of the Republican, of this Republican administration and any future ones. Thirdly, when Secretary Pompeo presented the report, he stressed that something like that deep down the United States is a good country whose venerable name should not be besmirched by protesters asking for a reckoning with structural racism. Sushma mentioned that already. He went out of his way in Philadelphia at the presentation to go after the 1619 movement and, and uh, the program and a number of other things. 
However, the constitutional conservative can take cues from the report about the need for a much deeper reckoning than the secretary himself offered. So the report is actually much at a much different place here. For example, we read here that even the new deals, so it's a quote from the report, even the new deal sweeping reform of labor law excluded agricultural and domestic workers, a large proportion of whom were members of racial and ethnic minorities. That quote ends. So, so what this means is the new, the, new, the new deal social security reform had some provisions that basically made sure that specifically African-Americans did not benefit from these reforms. Right? This is, I think, a fact that most Americans, certainly the kind of conservative that I have in mind here that needs to rethink things, uh, but also a lot of people who care much more about these issues than that conservative does are actually woefully unaware of. But it is precisely those facts that writers like ta Coates have used as starting points for demands for reparation for African-Americans. So this report acknowledges those starting points that other writers who are clearly not in a, in a right-wing corner have used to ask for operations. So again, one would hope that the Trump administration will integrate recognition of such facts into its own thinking about structural injustice, that Secretary Pompeo will adopt this particular sentence as one of his talking points from the report, and that conservatives will insist on a more honest reckoning with the American narrative. This report actually is supportive of that. Fourthly, the constitutional conservative may be wondering whether the report interprets religious liberty as a claim right that outweighs other rights, for instance, in the sense that a baker may refuse for religious reasons to bake cakes for gay weddings. However, there's no support whatsoever for this position in the report, even though it's the kind of rhetoric that Pompeo tends to use still. Religious liberty is consistently understood in this report as a liberty right, so as a kind of freedom of worship, one can only hope that conservatives will ask of their representation in Congress to insist on the stance, so to understand religious liberty again as the religious, religious freedom as a liberty right, so I'm allowed to do something, not as a claim right, I'm allowed to exercise my profession in ways that outweighs the emancipatory concerns of other people. Right? That's what lots of people were worried about, that the report would support that. And Pompeo, of course, acts as if the report did that, but it's actually not in the language of the report. Fifthly, the constitutional conservative may wonder what the report says about the goals of American foreign policy. While the report is clear that the American rights tradition should enter into the formulation of foreign policy, it does actually not spell that out in terms of the by now infamous reference to property and religious freedom that is attributed to the framers quite rightly at the beginning of the, is attributed to them at the beginning of the report. The report, however, spells this out in terms of democratic process and freedom broadly conceived. So the report says American foreign policy should be concerned with democratic process and freedom broadly conceived, not specifically religious uh, liberties. And again, one can only hope that conservatives will demand of the Trump administration to consistently take this stance, especially in its interactions with autocrats. And finally, the commission emphasizes that the United States can make human rights credible in foreign policy only if it recognizes the gap between its own pretensions and reality. It's there repeatedly. And once again, this is nothing like what we are getting from the government. There is no recognition of anything like a gap between pretensions and reality. But it's what the conservative now learns they have reason to ask of the government. So the intellectuals whom Pompeo trusted draw his attention to a gap between pretensions and reality that this government should, should acknowledge. So to conclude, we'd presumably, we'd presumably be better off not having a report that assesses human rights from the standpoint of a constitutional conservative with ex ante misgivings about international law. Yes, we should do this very differently. But here it is, the report is here, they're not going to scrap it. And at this stage, our question is no longer anything like whether we want to get involved in its drafting or things like that. But what we can do as human rights movement is to use the report to engage such conservatives to show them how their very own stance generates much more serious human rights commitments than they might have thought. And making good on, on what the report asked for will still, of course, fall far short of what we want for the world we live in,
but it would be an enormous improvement over what this government is doing to actually have this report realized and these human rights goals. The human rights movement should encourage conservatives and they are the only really serious, seriously intended readership. And again, this is a problem by itself, but here we are uh, to engage with this report and press for change along such lines. And then we'll take it from there. Thank you. Well, thank you, Matthias. Uh, very provocative, raises a range of questions for me, but right now I'm gonna just turn it over to Katie uh, for her remarks and then Andrea, and then we'll have a round of questions and conversation. Thank you, Sushma, and thank you, Matthias. So I do think that the exercise of analyzing a country's deep commitments to human rights can be a very fruitful one. Uh, it's not unusual from an international perspective. Uh, nonetheless, it's a very serious exercise uh, with very demanding process requirements. Uh, there should be reasonable opportunities for widespread participation and involvement at the domestic level. Uh, and of course, a vigilant acknowledgement of the international audience, uh, both in terms of the potential for constructive and mutual social learning, uh, but also the caution that a report like this could provide cover to homegrown justifications for human rights backsliding or even infringements in other countries. And that's the big picture and the big worry to this report. So with that in mind, I want to mention three aspects of the Commission's draft report that do diminish this exercise and two flow from the very restricted mandate of the Commission and the third might be seen as bringing the US closer con to contemporary human rights, much of the spirit of Matthias's comments, but in reality are far more complicated. So first, the Commission was chartered to provide advice and recommendations to the Secretary of State grounded in the nation's founding principles and the 1948 Universal Declaration of Human Rights. And it's hard to overstate what a restriction and a departure this is for contemporary human rights thinking. And this restriction is sewn into the very structure of the report. The Universal Declaration of Human Rights is of course a clear landmark, an incredible achievement of a common, a, a common standing uh, across the world uh, for human rights rights protections. So one shouldn't diminish what was achieved by that and uh, what was achieved by the Declaration of Independence. But there have been 70 years and more than 70 years of social learning and human rights struggles that have taken place in the interim. At the moment of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights uh, resolution, there were only 56 member states of the United Nations. So we've seen a massive effort of decolonization. There are now 197 nation states. Uh, there's also been incredibly uh, vigorous movements against racial discrimination uh, for women's equality, for children's rights, for disability rights for migrant workers' rights and others. And these have been formulated in the core human rights treaties. So the restricted mandate of the commission meant that the incredible claimants that that, that have been uh, recognized in treaties and since were missing. And also the fact that um, many of the institutions that developed a very plural understanding of these human rights commitments were simply uh, uh, not recognized by the report or unfortunately their work was, was diminished in the rhetoric of the report. So uh, that does a signal a very restricted output, um, but I do want to note one step forward that, that has already been mentioned. And this is the recognition of the indivisibility of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, human rights, that is economic, social, cultural, civil and political rights are on par. Um, this is a set of interlocking uh, principles within the Universal Declaration that can't be severed. And this is an important recognition. This does recognize everyone's, everybody on the world in the world's right to an adequate standard of living, including healthcare, education, housing, food, um, social security, uh, just work and uh, uh, education. Uh, the US of course is credited with ensuring or helping to ensure that these rights were included in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, the important idea of freedom from, from want alongside freedom from fear, uh, freedom of worship, freedom of speech, were included in, in the preamble through the efforts of the United States. 
but for a long period, these rights have been diminished, including in US foreign policy. And so in reading the Universal Declaration as a holistic document, the, the report certainly steps forward and brings the United States far more in line with other countries around the world. The Covenant on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights has, for example, 176 state parties and there are uh, more constitutions around the world than not that recognize these rights um, as fundamental human rights. So in taking this step, uh, this is a significant move towards contemporary understandings, but I do think this step is taken in a rather begrudging and ungracious way, if I can use the inverse of how the report describes the US recognition of religious freedom. Um, there's a failure to engage with economic and social rights movements internal within the United States, such as Martin Luther King Jr's Poor People's Campaigns, the welfare rights movements, the housing rights movements, water and sanitation movements, education movements, labor protection movements within the United States. And there's a failure to engage with the incredible efforts that have been going on at the international plane to make such rights real, to realize such rights through a, a very integrated economic order. The report does mention that foreign policy should take into account economic and social rights, and it mentions this can be done through development assistance. Um, but this is seen as a somewhat flawed process for ensuring humanity's access to these uh, rights often linked to basic human needs. Uh, there are many duties that have been heavily articulated, such as duties to ensure the international financial institutions of which the US is a member, are securing these rights in exercising their own policies, duties to ensure that private actors, including corporations, are also respecting such rights when they engage with resources and workers across the world, and duties to ensure, for example, economic sanctions uh, don't undermine rights to medicine or to food. Um, there's extraordinary work done around economic and social rights uh, at the international level. One could say this report is a starting point, but I am not optimistic about that, um, given uh, some of the rhetoric around property rights is first and foremost within the US tradition. I think uh, these comments are, are mischaracterizing the US traditions around life, liberty and happiness. Uh, and they're also suggestive of a kind of sphere that's off limits to governments, which can't be true if one is taking seriously rights to healthcare or housing or education, which are so permeated today uh, by private actors and markets. So this is why I'm somewhat pessimistic about the very steps forward that the report is taking, pessimistic about the process uh, that was secured in, in passing the report um, and uh, find that the draft report does uh, become a diminished exercise as a result. Thank you, Katie. Uh, I'll turn now to Andrea. Thank you so much, Sushma, and thank you to the Carr Center uh, for, for inviting me here. I come at, at this issue from a slightly different perspective from my colleagues in that I'm a human rights practitioner uh, on a day-to-day -day basis and not an academic. Um, one of the things that I find uh, most troubling about this report and, and was con concerned about from the outset is that uh, as Matthias mentioned, this is to some extent a conversation amongst conservatives. And I do think there's a lot that conservatives can take from this report. And to a certain extent, conservatives inside the US were the initial target of the report. Uh, if you look back at the timeline, the secretary had planned for this report to be released around the same time that there was a deadline for him to submit his name if he were to run for Senate in Kansas. There's a lot of speculation that, that those two things were connected. As it turns out, um, things have changed. But as much as internally, the conversation may be directed at conservatives inside the US. This report is intended to be a, a set of policies and guideposts for externally facing work. This report is, is purported to be a grounding or a framework for US diplomats to take its message around the world. And in large part, because of that, that's part of why I find it so troubling. Uh, you know, as a, a practitioner, what I hear from my colleagues who work in countries around the world or myself when I meet with foreign governments is a, a pointing to the US as a human rights abuser and as a hypocrite. I hear time and time again from military officials, from government officials saying, who are you to say to us that we should abide by our human rights commitments? Look at what the United States is doing. And that's not just under this administration. To be clear, I was hearing that under the previous administration as well. 
Um, and this report, which in my view sends a message that human rights may be interpreted in a way that is consistent with any particular individual country's history and tradition is a gift to some of those autocrats and dictators. It allows them to say, we would like to engage in the same practice as the United States, look at our own history, our own tradition, which might include slavery, indentured servitude, caste systems, uh, very minimal, if any, rights for women and girls and so on, and say, that's our tradition, that's our history, and we will interpret these universal rights through that lens. And I think we all know what happens when those rights are interpreted through that kind of lens. Uh, so in part, that's why I find it so, so dangerous. Um, you know, the really serious precedent that it, that it can set for others. Um, the, the second concern I have is the misplaced focus. At the international level, the United States really has abdicated its role as a key player when it comes to the global human rights movement. And that is something much more specific to this administration. So actions like the withdrawal from the UN Human Rights Council, um, threatens to veto a Security Council resolution on women, peace, and security simply because it referred to reproductive health care for survivors of sexual violence, cutting off funding to the WHO, UNESCO, other international institutions. Those are the steps that the United States has taken with respect to multilateral fora, when what we need is for the United States to be playing a constructive role. When those very institutions that people rely on around the world to defend human rights are at risk, they need to be supported, and instead we see the U.S seeking to dismantle them. Those actions have really, as I said, sidelined the United States. The United States is not a key player in the international human rights system right now. Now, the US is not a leader in human rights in many respects. And certainly, although I focus on foreign policy, we could spend hours and hours talking about human rights abuses inside the US, as we should. Um, that does not mean that the US has not consistently, or for a long time, though inconsistently, <laughs> been an important player in the international scene. It simply is not the case anymore that the weight of the United States condemnation is as powerful as it used to be. That a, a US public statement about political prisoners carries much weight. Uh, it used to be that we would encourage members of Congress and, and the administration to talk about political prisoners by name because just having their names spoken by US government officials might keep them alive. The power of the, the US statement is so diminished right now that I don't, I don't think that's the case anymore. I think that Autocrats around the world know that the president, the secretary, anyone in the US government might say one thing and then mean another. And you can look, for example, to the way that um, Saudi Arabia has been treated by the US as a true demonstration where the US may condemn, for example, the killing of Jamal Khashoggi, but then not actually hold anyone responsible, truly responsible to account. So this sort of double speak and this abdication of its global role is where I see the real threat to human rights right now. And the role of the US is diminishing the international system rather than strengthening that. Um, that's part of why I find the, the report so concerning. The third point I wanted to make is one that I think Katie really addressed already, which is that the reliance on the Declaration of Independence on the UDHR, those are great documents. They're important. They're foundational. They set forward some really important principles. They don't talk about obligations at all. They don't talk about what states must do. They don't talk about the rights that citizens and people in the territory of states have and can demand from their governments. And again, unfortunately, we don't live in the sort of world where we can all point to lofty principles and say, I have this right and therefore it must be. Uh, it's the case that we require governments to take affirmative action to guarantee those rights. And by referring to documents that don't set forth any sort of protocol for how governments can do that, I think that, that the reference even to those human rights is, is weakened. Um, finally, because I want to leave some time for questions and comments, I would say that the entire premise of this commission was that there was this proliferation of rights. And I think that that premise itself is entirely misplaced. It is not the case around the world that new rights are being discovered or claimed or asserted. It is that people who have been denied those rights time and time again are finding the opportunity to seek to claim them. That's very different from finding a new right. And I think the entire message, the entire premise of this commission is really deeply flawed. Um, as Matthias set out, you know, human rights advocates have, have raised a lot of concerns from the beginning of this process. The report that was released on the 16th purports to be a draft report, though um, it looked quite 
thorough and final <laughs> to those of us who read it in detail. Uh, it has been open for a period of public comment this afternoon. Human Rights Watch submitted its comment and many other human rights groups, academics, and others have submitted public comments. Um, in a break from its uh, rather untransparent approach, uh, the Commission is posting all of those comments as soon as they are submitted. So they're all available online now. So please take a look at those. Uh, you can't see transcripts or videos of testimony because those have not been made public, at least to date, but those comments are available. Um, so I really would encourage people to take a look at those. Um, in sum, I guess I would say Matthias was the optimist, Katie was the pessimist, and I, I, I don't know, I think I'm maybe the, the firefighter trying to, <laughs> trying to put out the flames that I see engulfing us. Um, but I really look forward to everyone's comments and thoughts about these various approaches. Thank you. Thank you, Andrea. And I neglected to say that I'm also a practitioner, so <laughs> just hiding <laughs> out here. So um, there's a couple of questions from the audience, and uh, some of them touch on questions I had as well as I was listening to all of you speak. So I'm wondering if we could just take a step back for those uh, people who are not immersed in this field or in this body of work on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, can one of you share a little bit more about sort of the the motivation for this report, how this commission was constructed. Uh, I remember a year ago when this came into, into um, existence, Matthias's comment that um, this may be like the one intellectual <laughs> endeavor coming out of this current administration. So um, just like, like what, is the, um, what is the rationale? How are these people pulled together? And um, what are their ideological or political motivations of the people who are on this commission? So if one of you could respond to that, there's a few other very, very interesting questions that are being um, posed. So I'll come to those after. Katie, do you wanna take that in terms of the commission's sort of founding and its members? Uh, sure. So the commission was established um, with this uh, mandate. Uh, uh, there was um, a special uh, charter set up. As I said, it was a very restricted mandate. Uh, the, the commissioners themselves were handpicked. Uh, there was a lot of commentary at the time that they did uh, represent uh, quite a homogenous body of, of uh, commissioners. Uh, th this didn't seem to be a bipartisan across the aisle extension of um, many different voices. Uh, some comment commented that um, their, their backgrounds were um, heavily loaded uh, in terms of knowledge around religious freedoms, um, but not particularly loaded up with knowledge of contemporary human rights. Um, and so this is the, the commentary of the structure of the commission was faulting uh, the makeup. That said, the chairperson of the commission, uh, Marianne Glendon, has authored a very significant study of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and the role of Eleanor Roosevelt uh, in assisting in the drafting of that document. And, and she was seen as a very respected figure for uh, bringing attention to the role of the United States at that time, as well as the diversity of the UN Human Rights Commission uh, in 1948 that established the Universal Declaration. So she did a lot of careful historical work um, over a decade ago um, in a book that, that has been included, I, I guess, in, in any human rights textbook that you pick up. So she does have the knowledge of the Universal Declaration. Uh, she also served uh, uh, as uh, US representative to the Vatican um, and has occupied a number of roles. Uh, many people criticize the fact that there wasn't enough diversity alongside her um, in, uh, in really rising to the challenge of articulating human rights for the Sec Secretary of State for the use of guidance in American foreign policy. Um, and I think that Andrea can speak more to um, some litigation that was, uh, uh, that was um, filed, um, a suit was filed against um, the, the mandate. Um, but the, the kind of back and forth that we've had with many weighing in um, has been uh, a, a, on the content of the commission, uh, there's been less criticism of those who've appeared before the commission. There, there has been a diversity of experts brought to DC um, to give testimony on their understandings. Their, uh, their testimony has itself been restricted by that mandate, I should say. So we're, we're still hearing from testimony that's cut off from 
um, up until 1948, although some developments post-1948 are included in the report. Uh, and I mentioned the process requirements as being quite demand demanding. Unfortunately, this wasn't um, a necessarily hugely attended uh, uh, exercise. Um, when I compare this to the kinds of constitutional um, commitments that are established between countries uh, within countries when they engage in this kind of analysis. You can see um, further efforts to bring different representatives in, um, both in terms of participating um, as well as giving expertise. There is an agenda for uh, the commission to privately engage with a number of different represent representatives, uh, but that's, that's what I could say about its founding. I can just jump in with a little bit of information. There is a, a pending lawsuit that challenges the commission's structure under the Federal Advisory Committee Act uh, because the commissioners, when one lo looks at their background, it's pretty uniform, um, which is inconsistent with, with the act. There are also a number of procedural problems. Uh, the commission, as I, I mentioned, the, inf the transcripts are not released. Uh, although the commission hearings were ostensibly open to the public, they required pre-registration uh, the commission hearings were inside the State Department building and there was a cutoff. So a number of diplomats who work in uh, embassies in Washington would say to me, well, I, you know, I got there 10 minutes before it started and they told me I couldn't come in uh, because they weren't there at the 15 minute cutoff. The commission uh, sessions were hours long and people weren't allowed to have their coffee even though it started early. You know, little things that, that add up because they don't suggest an interest in public engagement. And then we also, separate from the lawsuit, but one of the issues Human Rights Watch has raised is that aside from the commissioners themselves not having a diverse range of views, they didn't seek views from a diverse range of human rights activists. Uh, and, and I think the report really clearly reflects that. Although some human rights practitioners, including Human Rights Watch's executive director, Kenneth Roth, were invited to testify and, and did do so, um, the commission, I don't, I think they ended up taking eight eight people in live testimony. I don't have the number offhand, but you know, it, it was not extensive. And if you think about just briefly sort of think about the Black Lives Matter movement and the number, the hundreds of organizations that are represented on the streets of any city today, uh, think about international human rights and how many stakeholders there are and testimony from, you know, eight, even if it was 10 or so, uh, human rights and experts and academics is really quite minimal. So that's one of the significant concerns we had, which we raised in the comment we submitted today as well. Terrific. So um, there's a question which sort of parallels something that I was thinking, and I'm going to raise it uh, to you, Matthias. Uh, so there's a question from um, one of the members of the audience, um, which is, what is the value of engaging with this report and with the commission and with con constitutional conservatives, as you suggest, in terms of, um, you know, creating a more expansive horizon for human rights, both in the US and abroad, versus um, looking to the future and saying, how do we ensure um, that the um, government, uh, you know, the new administration is more responsive to human rights in the future? Because the people who have created this report and the commission are not necessarily going to change their views. Well, I mean, if the starting point is that the people that the people are not changing their views in a way, then that's kind of where the engagement ends, right? So uh, I try to make a suggestion here for, you know, making strategic use of what this commission has now produced, you know, given, given that, I mean, I, I have no disagreement with the concerns that Katie raised about, you know, there's this whole human rights landscape, you know, that wasn't really engaged with and that wasn't properly brought in. I have no disagreement with, you know, the uh, Andrea's concern about how, how massively the human, uh, the human, the American, American stances are falling short of what they should be in the human rights domain. So, so all of that is kind of a given. But what my suggestion is here basically is to say, okay, so this has happened now, you know, they, they have chosen a particular trajectory. Here we are, they have released it. What I'm suggesting is that we should actually hammer home the point that the government's entrusted intellectuals themselves are calling on the government to take human rights a lot more seriously and to take the international order a lot more seriously than they're doing. So, so take a contrast, uh, some years ago, 
when they still had more, you know, sophisticated people in the, you know, in the government before they, everybody who disagreed with Trump on anything was basically forced out. H.R. McMaster and Gary Cohn published a widely discussed um, article, I think, in the Wall Street Journal and, and, and some news outlet, uh, kind of outlining the Trumpian view of the world. And it basically declared the end of anything recognizably international order and that Trump was just one who recognized that and came to terms with that reality, right? And even though these guys are gone in a way, this is still where this administration is. That's how we see the world. And the government's own, own anointed and appointed intellectuals are calling them out on that and say, no, this is not how it is. And I think that is, given all the suboptimality we are already in by being at this point, this is a point worth bringing home in addition to all the concerns that are very valid. That's kind of my main point. So um, my understanding is that, you know, the, um, the phrasing of uh, gender justice and reproductive rights, it's quote unquote, divisive social and political controversies and not human rights has raised uh, alarm bells among um, a wide range of human rights organizations. So I'm wondering uh, whether this report can really be viewed at a surface level as something we can work with and engage with, or if it's really something that could um, result in changes in uh, U.S. policies, whether it's foreign policy or aid policy being conditional or ways in which uh, State Department reports are written or the work of, um, you know, um, the diplomats is done internationally. So I, I'm curious if uh, either Katie or Andrea or even Matthias, if you can comment on that, because uh, while the while the commission's report may not have been as bad as we thought, there there's cause for alarm with the, the way the report was uh, commissioned, the way it was approached, the process for input and the final document itself, so. If I can start, I, I think it's very important not to cede the ground to the report to say that this is uh, now an American understanding of human rights um, in the four corners of the report, but to acknowledge um, just how diminished it is. Uh, so I think going forward, um, yes, one can recognize, as I mentioned, how further this takes the US foreign policy in terms of particular rights, economic, social and social rights, cultural rights are not mentioned as extensively. Um, but one needs to recognize there's so much that has been done. Um, the, the Convention on the Elimination of Discrimination Against Women, the Convention on the Elimination of Racial Discrimination, uh, the Convention on the Rights of the Child, all of these conventions, as well as the uh, Civil and Political Rights Convention, the Economic, Social and Cultural Rights Convention, have uh, created incredible opportunities for comment on both the United States uh, human rights practice and its practice abroad. Uh, there are also special procedures of the United Nations. There are independent experts um, uh, with particular thematic mandates or country mandates, special rapporteurs established by the UN Human Rights Council. Uh, these have been described as the crown jewel of the UN human rights system. They go out uh, and actually analyze facts um, against particular benchmarks and provide us with an incredible source of information. Uh, so we, we we shouldn't cede that territory and suddenly throw up our hands and say, well, now human rights don't look the way we wanted them to. Um, let's abandon this discourse for something else. Um, that would be a, a, a misstep. Uh, there are certain criticisms to be made about human rights. And I think uh, the human rights commentary I read is often the most self self-critical commentary out there. Um, but uh, it's important, I, I think, not to cede that territory and also recognize the kind of politics at the moment is a strange politics of, of dealing in truths and, and misinformation, um, that there are um, movements that uh, deal with facts in a way that we perhaps uh, wouldn't have seen 15 years ago. Uh, this is a real crisis, particularly with the press the way it is. There are, there's a sense that we need to grab on to information and, and, and inquire as to its sources and be careful when a document is cherry-picked as Pompeo cherry-picked the comment about um, the first and foremost right to property, I think out of context because there is more nuance in the report itself. So we have to be concerned about this, the, 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 the trucking in information, um, the distractions that are created and by you know, retaining the agenda of human rights and sticking to that agenda. <laughs> 
There's a follow-up question that was posted on the chat that connects to my question, which I'll also pose in case uh, you want to respond, which is about um, the uh, impact that this report might have on uh, U.S. foreign policy uh, and its connection to multilateral institutions, including like the role of the World Bank and other institutions. So I talked about foreign aid and I talked about um, the role of diplomats, et cetera, neglected to mention the World Bank. So institutions like the World Bank and other IFIs. Andrea, any thoughts? Yeah, very quickly. I mean, these are absolutely integral institutions that have long been criticized as not engaging with human rights uh, uh, appropriately. Um, and so these are institutions that are very influenced by US foreign policy, the World Bank and the IMF, were the original Bretton Woods institutions that were to establish an international economic order that reached standards of equality and fairness. These really strayed from the mission um, and the economic and social rights that were recognized uh, in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and in the follow-up treaties were often put to one side and simply not referenced in the work of the international financial institutions. There are other UN uh, agencies such as the, the Food and an Agricultural Organization the United Nations Development Program. These are all guided um, much more by uh, human rights than they used to be. There are certain agreements to, to emphasize uh, human rights now, but it's clear that the multilateral framework has to be injected with human rights scrutiny and monitoring. Um, and the international financial institutions play an incredible role. Now with COVID-19 and the health and economic crises that have been unleashed, there's even more opportunities for both devastation and also rescuing and changing the course of the crisis that's to come. There's a lot of work being done by the special procedures of the UN to establish certain benchmarks to make the economic recovery that we hope to experience um, after this incredible financial contraction to be as respectful of economic and social rights as possible. There's a lot of work being done to analyze why austerity may not be a human rights compatible response to the inevitable crisis. Um, so there's incredible work for multilateral institutions like the international financial institutions to pay um, attention uh, both to um, uh, kind of criticize policies like austerity and the way they may damage human rights and also um, to recommended policies such as working through debt financing, um, uh, uh, working through uh, taxation structures, working through financialization um, of uh, uh, various um, uh, basic uh, goods and services by governments. Incredible work to be done. There's a lot of human rights voices in this in in making you know in this space making recommendations that we should take on board. And U.S. foreign policy has an incredible role to play uh, in engaging with those voices. Right, so um, I'm gonna pose a question, which is a pretty big question to each of you, um, because I know we'll be running out of time in a little bit. And so, you know, I think one of the critiques of human rights organizations has been that we often will uh, name and shame or point at the gaps, but what we really need to do is come forward with our own solutions, our own proposals, our own visions of how to actualize a better world. And so I'm wondering if each of you could speak to um, you know, if we were to think about a, a more ideal report from a more ideal commission in a more ideal um, state of the country and the world, what are some key ingredients, whether procedural or substantive, what are the issues to focus on? And in Matthias's case, um, it's a little bit of a trick question because I'm going to ask you to also weave in some of the work of our Renewing Rights and Responsibilities Project. And, uh, you know, so, uh, so maybe I'll start with you, Matthias, because you had a head start with being immersed in this body of work uh, for the past year, along with John Shattuck and others at the center. So, you know, uh, how could we, we envision um, a human rights report on how to build, whether in the United States or around the world, uh, a greater commitment to the full range of rights? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so in, uh, in, in terms of whether that's anything, you know, that's actually in the range of what's possible for the car center, we have basically, we are kind of putting our, our money where our mouth is quite, uh, quite literally, right? Because we, we, have, we have undertaken an effort like this that will be, uh, 
rolled out, brought to the attention of the of the public uh, fairly soon. Uh, that is this project of uh, renewing human rights and responsibilities in the United States. And that was a, and now that's why this project also has been, uh, the, the Pompeo Commission has been very much on my radar because we had basically just started with our own project of looking at the human rights situation in the United States when Pompeo announced his commission. And that was clearly done in a, in a, in a very different spirit. And our concern really was more driven by things actually of the sort that Andrea mentioned earlier, that there's all these deficiencies, right? That, that uh, uh, actually, you know, both, both Andrea and Katie elaborated on that, right? How much, how many, how many human rights standards are out there, in, even just if we're just limiting ourselves to those that the United States has fully endorsed and has been crucial in, in, in implementing. So, so many human rights commitment there and look at the reality, right? The reality really is highly problematic across the board of issues and and uh, so what we did as, uh, as a human rights center, we, we started this project of just really looking, taking, uh, as, we, uh, as we have gotten accustomed to saying, kind of a selfie of the human rights reality in, in this country to see where we are. And again, this has often been, uh, so in that sense, I'm, Andrea, I'm really not, the, not, not, not across the board an optimist. So I wasn't very optimistic about what we'd find there. Uh, and the results were often much more devastating in terms of the human rights reality in the United States. And so that's the kind of thing that we can do. And we hope as Car Center to make a uh, constructive uh, contribution also to the human rights discourse in this way. And also once the report, this report comes out also to even more connect to civil society organizations around this in order to, to make a constructive contribution to uh, an improvement. So that's the kind of work that, that we are in the process of doing at the Car Center. Right, Katie? Sure, well, human rights um, folks sometimes get criticized for thinking through utopias, but uh, I'm not gonna go there. I would recognize that the spirit of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights is something to really laud, you know, the, the fundamental importance of, of the value of the equality of all um, equal in dignity and rights. I mean, that's a particularly amazing, um, uh, baseline uh, of thinking through uh, human rights protections around the world. Uh, I think the effort to define dignity and freedom uh, and equality are very important ones. Uh, we have to define them in light of acknowledging the finite resources of the world and the pressures that come uh, through unexpected uh, uh, sources such as pandemics, um, but also expected threats such as climate change and the extraordinary economic inequality that we're seeing around the world. So we have to rethink through these values of what they can possibly mean in the current context. And many people are doing that. This is not a top-down exercise of thinking through what, what, what this looks like. This is a, an exercise of listening um, that many proponents are articulating dignity and, uh, and equality and freedom in a kind of vernacular that can respond to uh, human rights uh, tribunals and fact finders. Uh, we have a lot of information about how this looks. Uh, and I think um, this isn't a singular exercise of a nation state to undertake, um, but I take uh, respect in, in the position that any country wants to engage in a, in a careful analysis, both of its own human rights record and what this means as it's outward facing. Um, there are, uh, um, I think good signs um, uh, when this happens of, of real evolutions in understandings of, of new, uh, uh, not new rights, but new claimants who are articulating human dignity and equality and freedom uh, and recognize the special importance to them. Um, and so this is what I see as um, the efforts of um, the human rights community. And I don't think it's far from what many are doing, um, really recognizing just extraordinary threats, the threats of the changing um, you know, artificial intelligence environment that we're seeing, the threats of the changing politics that we're seeing uh, from um, populism and movements of this nature. So we, we kind of take stock of threats and re-articulate these values in light of them. Great, thank you. Andrea? Well, a true assessment of what the United States should be doing with respect to human rights would be wonderful. Um, as I said, you know, the domestic issues are uh, multiple and I won't go into those here. But on the foreign policy side, for example, what I would love to see is a recommendation that the US ratify all of the treaties that it has failed to do so. 
uh, just as, as we're celebrating 30 years of the Americans with Disabilities Act, um, it's a good time to stop and remember that the U.S. hasn't ratified the Disability Rights Convention, uh, you know, among and many other specific protections. Um, you, mentioned, you mentioned Sushma Human Rights Reports. Uh, you know, could, could this report be used to inform those? I would just point out, for those of you who don't track this issue, the State Department has already cut all reporting on reproductive rights from the Human Rights Reports. Uh, so I'm not sure that they could cut any more <laughs> based on the commission's report, um, but I would love to see a restatement about the value of those reports and what we truly believe they should be assessing when it comes to human rights around the world. I think the U.S. should be doing its own human rights report as well and put itself alongside all of the countries it reports on so that we can understand what the sort of alleged baseline is. Um, and then I would love to see a very clear commitment or obligation in U.S. law that U.S. money not be utilized to perpetuate human rights abuses. And currently we have, for example, the Leahy laws, which prohibit the use of um, U.S. funding, military funding um, for gross human rights violations, um, but we do not have a comprehensive system that actually vets the use of U.S. funds, whether it's through USAID, whether it's certainly through um, the CIA or any other sources of funding. So U.S. dollars are, of course, used to perpetuate human rights abuses around the world. And um, I think we need a real comprehensive assessment of that. So those things, I think, together would, would form a really uh, helpful blueprint for how the U.S. could move forward when it comes to really trying to realize those commitments that are in the UDHR. Thank you. So we've covered quite a bit of ground on a very specific matter. Um, we've talked about the strategic need to uh, engage with constitutional conservatives, but also questioned whether the timing of that makes sense or whether it makes sense to really focus on our long-term goals. Um, we've discussed the fact that the, some of the content of the report really um, is not exactly the same tone and content as Secretary Pompeo's remarks, both at the release of the report as well as his remarks last year and, and wonder about sort of the intention behind his creating the commission as well as the uh, independence of the commission and the, and the individual members views. Um, uh, we've, you know, talked about um, the process or requirements for a report like this and whether this commission met those um, process requirements and it did not. And the combination of the composition of the commission the underlying intention of the creation of the commission and the report, the restrictive mandate drawing upon the UDHR and the US sort of founding documents, um, some of the concerns about the US historical response around economic rights um, and failure to acknowledge sort of domestic social movements in this area um, have raised questions for us about our path forward. Uh, we've also talked a little bit about um, the implications of this report for our policies internationally um, and the fact that the U.S. is being called out as a human rights abuser for by foreign governments who are quick to claim sovereignty as well as wanting to look at their own histories as a way to uh, justify certain prioritizations much as this report has tried to elevate uh, certain human rights issues We've talked about sort of the diminishing power of the, of the U.S., both soft power as well as ability to engage with uh, multilateral institutions and institutions of global governance and the implications uh, of that today. And we've talked about sort of this uh, uh, emphasis on proliferation and whether that's misplaced and whether it's really, um, you know, people who have been denied the right to claim their rights who are now uh, advocating both individually and collectively and um, how do we best ensure that the human rights movement is relevant uh, to include all of them? So this is a really rich uh, discussion among uh, you know, people who I think are largely aligned. And so um, I'm really looking forward to continuing the conversation with all of you. And for those of you in our audience who've joined us today, thank you so much for joining us. We will be taking a hiatus for events in August, but we'll continue this fall. Um, so please sign up for our mailing list, follow us on social media, and if you go to the CAR Center's website, you will see uh, Matthias's paper there, um, and um, we can also share, on, we've also shared on social media, 
things that Katie and Andrea have written on the Pompeo Commission. Um, so thank you all for joining us and look forward to seeing you in about a month or uh, month's time. And until then, stay safe and plan to vote in November. Thank you all. <laughs>